There we go, recording in progress. Uh, so welcome everybody. So this this uh, this special session is called Beautiful Brains. Now you may not think of brains as being particularly beautiful, but actually what they do is incredible. And we're hoping to inspire you about the beauty of our brains, celebrating the healthy brain um, while getting creative. So we're gonna be learning about ourselves, what could be more interesting and getting creative. The session is gonna be split into two halves like the brain itself. So the first half will be colouring and doodling. You might have had the chance maybe to print out some sheets. If you haven't, absolutely doesn't matter. I'll be showing you images to inspire. And we'll also, in the second half, be doing origami, because I reckon quite a few of you may well be here for the origami. Um, actually, before we get going as well, I've got a very short poll, because actually we're really curious to find out why you're here. And then that will also help guide us as to what would be good. So I've this is the first time I'm doing it. So I wonder if I could launch a very, very short poll, um, which lets us know whether you're here mostly for origami, for the arts and crafts, whether you're interested in the brain or whether you're interested in dementia. This is actually the final event. Oh, this is so interesting. Real data. We're all into data these days, aren't we? <laughs> Excellent. Ooh. People are adding those. So origami and arts and crafts. And actually, it's really quite equal, isn't it? That's really interesting. Fantastic. I'll let that whoop, continue for a moment. So it's a good old sprinkling. How fantastic. We're going to have a good, good mix there. Right, I'm going to end the poll. That's great. I feel as if everyone could be happy in this way. Thank you for that. So during this, this session, don't know whether you can see, can you see the results as well? Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Great. Um, so during this session, we will um, be getting creative and we've got, actually got two neuroscientists I'm gonna introduce in just a moment. Um, and please bear in mind that they're both scientists. None of us are medical doctors, so we can't answer any medical questions, but we'll do our very best to answer about the brain and to get creative as well. Big thanks to Alzheimer's Research UK who have funded this project. Um, Katie is actually from the charity. Um, and this is the final event for Beautiful Brains, which started pre-pandemic. And it was going to be a chance to go and visit lots of schools. I visited a school with some neuroscientists back in February 2020. And we we're about to visit lots of schools. And it was such a fantastic day. They got really creative. And of course, everything changed. So all we could really do was create resources online. And I just thought this would be a lovely chance to share them with you. Um, I know many of you will know me from the origami side. And there's real links, actually, with this. Um, so I wonder, actually, Emma, could you maybe introduce yourself? Yeah, hello, everybody. And my name's Emma. I work at the University of Oxford in the Drug Discovery Institute, which is funded by Alzheimer's Research UK. And um, at the Drug Discovery Institute, we're really interested in trying to find new therapies to treat Alzheimer's disease. Fantastic. Hazel? Hi, so I work at the University of Cardiff. Um, with the UK Dementia Research Institute, which has um, several bases around the country, one of which is in Cardiff. And I'm a postdoctoral scientist, and I'm interested in how complex genetic risk for Alzheimer's disease affects specific brain cells. And um, what we're doing in our project is taking blood samples from patients and growing the cells in the lab so that we can test how healthy they are and how well they perform their functions. Fantastic. Thank you, Hazel. And actually during this session, um, certainly with the colouring and doodling, I'm going to be gently asking both Hazel and Emma questions. Um, I've worked with them both and I think they're really good at explaining about the brain. So I hope, I hope you'll enjoy that. And I thought actually if we can ask questions through the chat box, I'll then post them to Emma or Hazel because otherwise we never know when, when each person can speak. So I'd be really grateful if we all keep on mute except for the the speakers and then the origami will be a lot more interacting together so here goes next slide mm. 
she says <laughs> ah there we go so um yeah this is sort of completing this project called beautiful brains it's been such a joy and hopefully this is a real ce celebration to, to finish with um so i've been creating some resources inspired by meeting scientists including emma and hazel and and developing some creative sheets for people to be able to use and print out there's also little films to accompany these as well so it's on the alzheimer's research uk website um, and it kind of goes in order from the whole brain down to imagining the brain as a city down to what it's made of with cells and then down to proteins I'll be guiding you through each of these, but I hope you can take them as artistic inspiration or learning a bit of science, learning about yourself. I hope it will brighten up this January day at the moment. So it may be if you haven't had the chance to look at them, really doesn't matter, but you might check them out later and it's something to share with people of all ages too. So our first activity, um, I thought it could be creative brains. Um, as mentioned, you may have been able to have a chance to print out a sheet. Absolutely doesn't matter if you haven't. I know lots of you won't have that, those kind of facilities at home, but you might have been able to print it on one side and actually I've printed it on the other side so you can actually cut it out and colour it. If you haven't got a sheet, then I recommend grabbing any piece of paper, looking at these, at these images, get inspired be asking Emma and Hazel questions about them and just kind of doodle your own colourful brain. Um, so yeah, uh, Emma, how, how sort of, you know, how much of our head is brain? What does it do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your brain is a pretty big proportion of your head, actually. Your brain weighs around, well, an adult brain weighs around 1.3 kilograms. So it's um, you know, pretty weighty. It's uh, There's a lot of it in there. You can see that from the, the picture um, on the top left of the slide that Lizzie's got that, um, you know, your brain's really well folded. So it's got lots of these kind of um, folds in it and that helps to increase the surface area of the brain. So you've got a lot of kind of tissue all kind of packed down into, into your head. And, um, you know, really the size of your brain is a good indicator of all of the things that make kind of humans unique in their ability to kind of um, you know think in the way that we do and and uh, and behave in the way that we do it's really i find one of the most interesting things is for a lot of the of our parts of the body you could look at other animals and they'd look quite similar but the brain really varies a huge amount doesn't it so if you look yeah. at animal brains there are well there are very few that are bigger i, I don't know elephants do you think elephants and whales hmm. yeah maybe maybe perhaps in terms of kind of uh you know, in, in relation to body size, maybe, maybe it's not so different, but um, yes. yeah, most brains are tiny compared to yeah. us. We really <laughs> do have big brains, and yeah. I guess I was trying to think of a way of how how do you fit all of this stuff into your head? It's by being wrinkly, like a the surface of your brain. I think of as the clever stuff, and you almost have to wrinkle it up into a ball to put it in there. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I know, um, Hazel, I guess this is, you're looking at tiny things, but these images that we've got at the top, at the top, and they're not, they're not from your work, but they are real images of real brains. Aren't, aren't they incredible? Yeah, I think they're fascinating. So um, the two that you can see at the top with all of the lines, um, they're, they're not real pictures, they're sort of mathematically reconstructed, but what scientists have done is they've looked at the sort of major connections um, that go between different parts of your brain and also from the brain down into the spinal cord. And these connections are showing up as sort of like roots, like roads through the brain, um, concentrations where there's lots of information traveling in that single direction. Um, and it's, it's very beautiful, as you can see. It does almost look like a kind of a really busy motorway, like those photographs where it's time lapse. You can almost imagine that. Um, yeah, they're, they're really beautiful, aren't they? And I, the colour there will have meaning as well. So you can show how busy different areas of the brain are. Um, so you might start on the sort of outside of the brain. And actually, we've sort of loosely break up the surface of the brain into what we call a lobes. And each area loosely does a different thing. So 
the very back is to do with vision. So we're using our eyes now. It's strange. Our eyes are at the front. It is the back of our brain that actually does the seeing. And it's very complex, different areas doing different things. Um, the top to do with touch and feelings. It's, I always think of it as an Alice band up there that's controlling and touch. The side to do with language and hearing. Um, I don't know if you've got anything else to add to this, Emma and Hazel. I'm just keeping it very loose. <laughs> Um, the front more to do with personality as well and making complex decisions and it's really only towards your 20s that that's more fully developed um, down here this little area it's called the reptilian brain the cerebellum which means little brain and that's to do with balance and movement and down at the very base most important in many ways it's called the brain stem that controls your heart beating and breathing um so kind of essential in a way that's the basis and then everything else builds on it the personality is the least essential but kind of important too um i don't know whether whether you can comment as well on any of the images uh, there's an image at the bottom left as well um hazel did you want to say anything about that yeah sure so um so the image that you saw in that Lizzie was holding up was from this, like looking at the brain side on, and it's kind of looks identical from both sides, but like mirror images of each other. Whereas the image in the bottom leftmost corner is actually looking straight on at the brain. So if you turn it um, perfectly, ah, oh, Lizzie's got got a natural brain. To shift. If you're looking at it. <laughs> Um, that the two parts, they're not a single person's brain because you would never, well, you'd hardly ever have a person where one side is bigger than the other side. What they're trying to show is that the, the left-hand half is the healthy size and shape of a brain where all of the folds of the brain really fill the space. Like it's really crammed and there's not many gaps between the folds. Um, in fact, the spaces there have been slightly exaggerated. On the right hand side of that picture is a much smaller looking shrunken brain with um, much bigger holes and spaces between all of the folds. And it looks like that because um, it's a representation of um, a very late stage Alzheimer's disease brain. Um, so Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia and essentially um, characterized by the loss of brain cells in the higher regions of the brain. So these are the brain cells that make up all of the folds, do all of the complex thinking. And if you lose them, then the whole size of the brain shrinks. Um, so this is quite a, a stark contrast. Um, and it's kind of like the classic image that's used in my field of research to illustrate why, why we're doing what we're doing. Hmm. And it, is it right that actually some areas have kind of um, decreased in size? Um, kind of the most like areas to do with language and being able to control mm -hmm. behavior as well. Well, we know that the hippocampus is particularly affected um, and um, it's a, it's a with... very tiny bit of the brain. It's a very small little bit that you wouldn't be able to see on one of these brain maps. You wouldn't even be able to draw it in, but um, it's a little section that's very important for long-term storage of memories. Um, so yeah, some bits are particularly affected, some bits are somewhat spared, so there won't be so much shrinkage at the back of the brain, um, there'll be more shrinkage on the top, front and in the little hipp hippocampus. Hmm. And, and I guess, I guess the real hope is obviously preventing getting to this point, because it's pretty hard to see how you could repair it at this point. It's yeah, yeah, what we're wanting to do is is not for people to get to that point because although you know although you may have heard of cell-based therapies where people are able to inject cells into parkinson's disease patients i can't really see we'll ever get to a stage where we can reconstruct a brain that's been as badly affected as that one um, so you want to catch it early and stop it from shrinking Thank you. Oh, and a big shout out to Veronica. It's great, great to, to see and to read what you're doing. So Veronica, raising awareness of arts to preserve brain health from the onset of symptoms. And I guess it, it's it's encouraging people to do things with however, whatever, whatever position you're in to create is a is such a healthy thing to express yourself and to keep yourself a little bit happier as well. So ARTS for brain health. Fantastic. 
great great to hear of your work Veronica um if people have got questions about the brain as well feel free to ask there is one really good story I have to say about how in many ways how we've learned about the brain um and this is very much historical but it's a great story about the front of the brain in a way as being the least essential but pretty important so there's um a man called Phineas Gage who was around over 100 years ago um, in America and he was he was involved in making tunnels um, for railways so he's working working on, on making new tracks and um, was in charge of making the kind of what's called a tamping iron trying to push in some explosives it doesn't sound a good idea does it um, and it accidentally went off and this lump of metal um bar of metal actually flew through the front of his head and out the other side so it went up sort of behind his eye through there it looked pretty horrendous apparently he was awake and still conscious you'd never think he'd survive such a thing walked into town found a doctor and said i've got some work for you uh, he then went into a coma for a couple of weeks incredible that he didn't get any infections um and he did wake up again but he changed he'd went from being a kind nice person to someone who was angry it could be swearing couldn't concentrate on anything um and so we've learned an awful lot as to as to how different areas of the brain what they do in a way by these kind of rare awful accidents but it's also quite fascinating isn't it too so that's Phineas Gage oh a question here is it good for your brain to take omega-3 supplements any thoughts um yeah, I think, you know, generally it's considered that what's good for your heart is good for your brain. So keeping yourself really fit and healthy and active is a really fantastic way to help you kind of um, help your brain stay to stay healthy. And omega-3 supplements have been shown to have you know a good effect on your brain as well. So really making sure that you look after yourself, including taking lots of vitamins, minerals, eating a really good healthy diet. And obviously, you know, kind of oily fish is a great source of that. Um, you know, great part of a, a good diet. Um, it's uh, it's all going to be um, really beneficial to you. So I would definitely advocate keeping fit and healthy and taking supplements if that's something you wish to do. And and I guess it, it will see later on actually how it relates to cells. The mm -hmm. three to some extent, the sort of fatty coating on some of the cells which are needed. Uh, another good question here um, from Bryony. Thank you for this, Bryony. We have a history of dementia within our family. What can we do as a family to reduce the risk of us in the future? Yeah, that's such a good question. I think Emma slightly touched upon that, that, um, that one of the best things you could do is just keep fit and active and healthy, um, keep a healthy weight do lots of exercise because as, as Emma says, what's good for your heart and for your blood circulation is also going to be beneficial for your brain. Um, but there's, it's not just that, I, there's quite a lot of evidence that um, keeping your mind active can keep you functioning very, very well. Even if you do start to get a little bit of damage occurring in the brain, your brain is very plastic and can work around that. And I've heard people recommend uh, taking up languages Learning languages is very good for, for making lots of new connections in your brain. But um, I wouldn't despair too much if you really, that's not something you really enjoy doing because um, I'm sure it'd be just as good to do crossword puzzles and uh, to learn new creative arts or anything that gets you thinking. Yeah. So Emma might be able to add if, I, if there's any other things she'd highly recommend. I, I think you've, you've captured everything nicely there, Hazel. You're absolutely right. You know, making sure that you just keep keep doing what you enjoy doing and you know learning new things as you go and, and keeping yourself good in a good sort of fit healthy um you know status is really important so yeah that's yeah. good variety looking after yourself um it seems yeah, making sure you control if you have um any disease medications that you have to take if you have inflammatory conditions keeping mm -hmm. on top of that because we know that inflammation could affect the brain Mm -hmm. um, so that's also something to bear in mind, but you might be a very healthy family. And actually, yeah, most, am I right in suggesting that in most cases it's kind of spontaneous rather than an inherited aspect? But I don't know. It's interesting because I work on complex genetic risk and um, we have like varying estimates from different studies that vary between 60 to 80% genetic heritability. 
And that's quite a difficult thing to really pin down because it depends on the population that you're studying and how you're doing it. But there's a high degree of heritability, but it's it's not a foregone conclusion that you're going to get dementia, even if you've got a few genes that give you a slightly increased genetic risk. Um, I'd say that it's still really important how you live your lifestyle um, and the choices that you make with your life. Um, and, and that's the bit that we do have choice on, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> we are, so that's all we can do. Um, yeah, great. Veronica also saying about using the using the arts I completely agree about exercise music dance drama singing yeah creating origami is really good too I reckon certainly you know hard work on the brain which has to be a good thing I'm going to ask just one more question and then we're going to move on to the next activity uh this is from Oliver um why is it that it's possible to awake from a coma and speak a language you never spoke before like a musical instrument that you've never played before I wonder whether you've been reading something really interesting there I don't know whether Either of you have got any comments? Maybe he's been reading some of the Oliver Sacks. Oliver Sacks. I love those. They're such great stories. But um, um, I actually don't know the answer to that one. Yeah, that must, that must be a very rare example. Emma, have you got any? I, I don't know, to be honest with you. It's, it's really fascinating, isn't it? I mean, maybe it just speaks to how amazing your brain is and maybe some of the things that we don't really know about it. Yeah, it's such a complex organ and... Um, you know, we, we're, we're learning new things about it all the time. So these these kind of um, stories are fascinating. And I think they're maybe offering new insights into how our brain works. So mm -hmm. you can't answer the question, Oliver, but that's... Uh, it's, it's a really difficult thing to study the brain because obviously you can't get in there with live people. We're looking at what's essentially a black box and doing our best with the, the techniques that we have to look inside. But we still don't really know exactly what we're looking at and it, it seems to be different with different people you can't assume that everyone's got exactly the same same brain as well mm. Mm. Uh, yeah I really recommend if you haven't read it amazing book by Oliver Sacks the man who mistook his wife for a hat the most incredible title and actually truly descriptive of a man who literally mistook his wife for a hat because different areas of your brain different things. and it's such a warm beautiful book it will I think really inspire you and actually how incredible people are at overcoming challenge as well um fantastic i think we're going we're getting more questions as well but just to introduce the next next topic um of thinking about the brain as a city i know emma you've been working with an amazing artist and and designer heather savage and she came up with this idea of thinking about the brain as a city uh, so i don't know whether it, i'm just doodling a brain whether you want to then start making it into a city or um, you can think think about that while we're chatting as well or else you may have a kind of a corrugated brain which shows healthy and unhealthy strips of your city and you can start coloring them in um, cutting it out folding it up and it makes a little 3d brain which has oh I don't know if we can get it unhealthy unhealthy <laughs> um, so they, these are things to be creative while we're chatting away. Emma, can you tell us more about the, the collaboration that you had, this Brain City? How was the Brain City? Yeah, so Heather, um, as Lizzie said, was a, a design student at the Arts University, um, at the, yeah, the University of Arts at Bournemouth. And um, she came up with this amazing analogy of your brain being like a city. And it really kind of speaks to this sort of complexity and the, you know, the kind of real connections that are going on in your brain. So, um, you know, she's sort of here demonstrating that, you know, your brain's got lots of these kind of um, building blocks in it, which are really kind of busy and working away to help kind of keep keep your brain working, keep you thinking, ticking over, being able to see things and, you know, touch things. And as, as Lizzie explained in the first slide about what all your different parts of the brain are doing, you know, really helps you, your brain function. So, um, but your brain can't function in isolation. And so you need to have this good flow of connection and, um, and kind of, uh, of, of information going from one, one cell to the other. And here, this is represented by the buildings. So you really do need to be able to ensure that your brain is working correctly and the information is flowing in a really smooth, um, smooth way. So in a, in a good, you know, when you visit a new city and it's really nice, you'll notice that things are working really well. There's not much kind of rubbish around. Everything's just ticking over nicely. But sometimes, um, as we know, in some cities and towns, 
things can uh, can go a little bit awry, especially with things like kind of rubbish collection. You know, we think maybe after Christmas there's a lot of rubbish around, isn't there? And sometimes the bin men um, are not coming particularly uh, often. So um, when you get a buildup of, of sort of rubbish and waste, it can really slow things down and make things a little bit kind of, uh, you know, less, less ordered and less functional. And our brain is kind of like that. So, um, you know, it's your brain is kind of producing waste all the time as, as a city does. And as people in a city live, they generate, they generate waste. But it's really essential that that waste is cleared up. And during um, Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, it's often the case that this waste isn't tidied away properly. And um, so that kind of capacity of the brain is lost. And that causes a big buildup of, of waste and, and um, debris within the brain, which stops the connections from working properly. And when the brain isn't connecting and information isn't flowing well, that causes some cells in the brain to die off and can lead to the symptoms that we associate with dementia and Alzheimer's disease in particular. So it's really essential that we make sure that those kind of rubbish collection, uh, the rubbish collection facility in the brain is working well um, to ensure the good flow of information in the brain um, as, it's, as it is in a good working city. I know, I know Hazel, you've been thinking as well of the brain almost like a garden as well. So gardeners who need to prune and presumably also get rid of the, the waste and look after <laughs> your garden. Yeah, it's a similar kind of analogy, but it, it presents... Um, the figure of the gardener as this kind of benevolent figure that looks after the brain by taking out the waste and also um, pruning overgrowth of connections. Um, but at the same time, in, in diseases such as Alzheimer's disease can turn into a, a less helpful, more destructive figure. So yeah, that, that analogy, it's kind of similar, but it presents it in a slightly different way to fit around the um, brain cell of type that I work on, which is the gardener. Um, but we it's a cell called microglia, and that's the benevolent gardener in the brain. Wow. I guess we've been hearing lots of lovely analogies, haven't we, with Professor Jonathan Van Tam with um, yeah, analogies to explain things. It is really helpful, isn't it? Um, I've got some questions. So I'm going to start firing a few questions as well. So thank you from Lynn, um, who's explaining that she has complex regional pain syndrome. Um, exploring using my own gut instincts great with art therapy to attempt to communicate my symptoms visually. Foggy brain is one of the least painful symptoms, yet one of the most frustrating. What similarities does CRPS and Alzheimer's have? I guess, obviously, just to say Emma and Hazel are not doctors, but I don't know if you've got any thoughts at all. Um, well, it's not my field of research, but whilst Emma was talking, I had a quick look at this on the internet just to see what we do know. And the latest reviews um, don't seem all that sure that there's a strong connection, but there might be a connection. But I can see that there's a kind of an underlying cause that contributes to both things. So that CRPS um, is contributed to by inflammation um, and chronic inflammation in the body we know is also a contributing factor to Alzheimer's disease. So that could be a link that the, there is between the two. Um, but yeah, it's not my field. So I definitely try and find a specialist on that to ask them. And it, it may be that, it, that it's really not that well understood because the brain is so complicated. So it's kind of ongoing research, maybe. Emma, I don't know if you've got anything else to add. <laughs> no, I think yeah, as, as Hazel, Hazel sort of um, explained it nicely there. So yeah, nothing else from me. Oh, another great question. This is from Isma. Um, why do we dream? What a great question. <laughs> Uh, I've had a few theories about this and one of them is that we're just trying to um, sort out things that we've experienced during the day but in a slightly random garbled order. Um, I think people generally think dreaming is a, is a helpful thing otherwise we wouldn't be doing it. <laughs> yeah, processing in some way. Uh, we know a lot of things do happen whilst you're asleep and that there's a certain pattern of brain activity that happens whilst we sleep and if that pattern of brain activity gets disrupted by use of drugs and things like that, then people don't feel very well rested when they wake up. And they also, um, over time, get less, um, less healthy, less well. Um, and I expect that dreaming is all a part of that, that process of just kind of clearing up things that we've experienced during the day to start anew for the next day. Mm. 
such a great area for creativity as well. I have to say my best ideas have come from from dreams or from that kind of processing overnight. I often find myself writing a little bit just as I'm beginning to fall asleep and that being really interesting. Um, well, some, some famous people have said that they've got their greatest inspiration from a dream that they've had. They've woken up and found the solution to a problem that they've been mulling over for a long time. I'm afraid that hasn't happened to me yet. <laughs> well, I've been a play after a dream and actually uh, a, a workshop I did many years ago. People still remember making brains that came to me from a dream of I was trying to learn about the brain while uh, thinking somehow I then had a dream about building a brain while chatting, which of course makes so much sense. <laughs> Strangely. Um, someone was just asking about the corrugated brain, about it was wondering whether the colourful bits are full of more rubbish. I think it's more that we've got that rubbish is generated all the time, but it's more that we've got the dust men or dust women or dust people coming and collecting rubbish so it's more I guess that it that there are ways to be able to process and get rid of the rubbish rather than that there isn't any rubbish it's more that process is, is that would you agree um, yeah absolutely it's um, you know even the, the the most healthy brain is generating waste all the time but it's it's all down to the way that it is disposed of in the brain so um, you know when, when that process goes wrong you do get this accumulation um, but uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's important to make sure that the brain is kept healthy and in order. Mm, fantastic. Um, so I'm going to keep us moving. Let's go on to our next next area because we've got 10 minutes and then we're going to get going on the origami, I think. Um, so we're on to creative cells. Again, you may or may not have the sheet, but this is definitely great territory for um, for doodling. And so I've um, done a few drawings here of different types of brain cells now i'm sure you've all heard of neurons brain cells and in a way that's what you think the whole brain is made of we'll find out maybe that's not the case um, they're very beautiful they look like branching trees like forests and in a way as scientists you'd have to pick out just a few because it's such a forest in there so in a way you get dyes that just go into a few. Um, again, as with all of these things, there's no color, they're so tiny, there's no color. So in a way it's these dyes that you add like paints that show up, light up these beautiful, beautiful cells. So our whole body's made out of cells and these are, I think are the most beautiful really, like these long trees. So you can see there's a little body which would have, which would have things like your nucleus, your DNA in there, and then these long branches to connect to others. So each, if I've got this right, each neuron could have connections with thousands of others, and they're not directly, directly touching each other. There's a tiny little gap, and it's that little gap where chemical could be released and will trigger off the next one, and that's like a little switch. So it's just so unbelievably complicated and incredible that that's what we're experiencing now. Around 100 billion brain cells um, and that's what we're experiencing the world with it is just it's astonishing I have to say I can never feel that I can quite grasp for that but I love trying um, I don't know whether, whether you've got anything to add to that um, Emma Hazel I suppose also thinking about dementia the areas the hippocampus which is to do with forming memories little tiny seahorse like structures in the brain forming memories are, are they particularly fragile those cells yeah, your brain has got a lot of different types of neurons in it. So, you know, we think that they're, you know, we break it down into a simple form and that you've got sort of neurons in the brain, but there are lots of different subtypes of those neurons. And some of them are a bit more susceptible to, to damage and changes in their little environment that they're situated in than others. And hippocampal neurons are, are quite um, susceptible to, to small changes. Um, and when they die back, you do get the the issue of kind of loss of memory. And as Hazel said, initially, um, you know, the, the hippocampus is very often um, sort of lost in, in late stage Alzheimer's disease. Um, actually, we're getting quite a few questions too. So we should keep up the questions too. Oh, so exciting. Um, a good question from Jess. Um, I don't know whether either of you would know about this. Is there a visual or physical difference in neurodiverse brains? I guess it's not quite your area, but any thoughts? Yeah, I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that one. <laughs> I'm not a very good neuroscientist. Well, I have a particular specialism and that's not one of them. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. As a scientist, you'd think, well, you know everything about the brain because you're a neuroscientist, but you end up 
with any research they have to specialize in their area so you can know an awful lot about that one topic I'm sure you do know lots but it's impossible to know about everything Emma do you know anything about that any comments I'm afraid I, I don't know in, in good detail but there are a lot of people that do study these sort of neurodiverse um, conditions and and there'd be a lot of research on that so um yes I'm, I'm sorry I can't answer you, you particularly well there like Hazel yes. Also there is, Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> there's yeah. a kind of secondary question about that from Marnie about whether you can tell the difference between neurodiversity and disease and um, the answer is decidedly yes because we've got um, particular chemicals that we're looking for, particular proteins, um, particular things that you can see down the microscope structures um, and so we're not just diagnosing dementia due to the like the shape of the brain or something we're looking for um, specific um, proteins that are misfolded, that are damaged, that are not normally damaged. Um, so you can definitely diagnose that, although more accurately after death, which is not very helpful <laughs> to people. People want to have a really good diagnosis whilst they're still alive. Um, but after their death, we know for sure what they've got. Yeah, a bit late, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's but, it all, late. but it helps. But we're getting better and better at it all the time. So there'll be tests in the future where you can just take a bit of someone's blood and say you've got this or that disease. Brilliant. Um, oh, there was an, some more questions. Oh, I don't know if I can pronounce this. This is an amazing, amazing word I haven't heard. First of all, I have prosopagnosia. Well, I've heard of that one. It's mentioned in one of the Sachs books. I think I've definitely come across it. So I don't see. So I don't see in pictures. Wow, that's so fascinating. It's so. It, it highlights that you know you're a perfectly healthy, normal person, but not everyone experiences the world in the same way. <laughs> yeah which has to be the case for all of us but obviously that's more more extreme I, mean, I have I have a husband who's an engineer and he's very good at like manipulating three-dimensional objects in his brain you know seeing what the other side looks like turning it around I'm very bad at that and I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with me we're just sort of different <laughs> but some things are practice I mean it's one of those things I think with art people can often say oh you know I'm not naturally talented or I can't do art and I think it's like anything it's practice and giving yourself a chance and being playful and positive so I mean in theory I could say that about music I can't play music it's just I haven't ever tried or had the chance to really learn and I don't think you can ever expect to just pick something up and just do it naturally I think I think it is something that you learn and maybe Hazel if you know if you were interested I think the interest bit is an important bit you, you could probably improve on that if that was something that you really wish to. But it's whether you want to as well. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. um, so another great question from Marka. Um, what helps make memories more secure? Any thoughts, uh, Emma? Well, I'm, I'm not very good at solidifying memories, but I know the theory behind it, which is that you can make memories better by linking them to something tangible. Um, so there are different techniques you can use. Um, I'm, you've probably heard of these things called memory palaces, where people link memories to um, physical buildings, structures that they're very familiar with. So they can just sort of walk around the building and, and you know, link a particular memory to a particular item or place in the building. Um, I think this is easier said than done. Um, <laughs> but I know that people, um, the strongest memories that people have are linked to smells. Um, that's not something that's easy to manufacture it just happens <laughs> yeah, I think there's also a, a strong connection between sort of emotion and memory as well so you know, it's easy to recall something at a time when you were really really happy and you know as Hazel maybe says things sort of like smells and um, the experiences that you have during the time that you're making that memory really does help to solidify it as well so then um, those are some things that, that help to kind of really make some of your your memory stronger um, and it depends also what it is that you talk about with memory I mean mm. for example with origami which we'll be coming on to so I was actually asked by a patient to learn origami and pass it on and it wasn't something I naturally did at all so I found it very hard and I do remember my brain literally hurting to try to remember something I did not find natural or easy and with time that's really changed and now I can sit there imagining and thinking about steps which is fascinating because I never had that aspect 
a four. But if you really want to remember, for example, a piece of origami, it's just about repeating it over and over again, and then it, it will happen. So repetition definitely is a way, which we all know from school. It's about, you know, but it, you also have to find a way to make that a little bit interesting or else you get fed up. <laughs> so. I guess there's the kind of two types of recall here. There's the recall where you're trying to remember facts and essentially you have to drum them in. Um, but if you're wanting to remember like experiences, bits of your life better, I think best advice is just to really focus on, on all of your senses in that moment. You want to recall a, a memory of being somewhere, then what does it smell like? What does it sound like? Um, what can you see? That sort of thing. Can you feel something beneath your hands? That will help you remember it better. Oh, here's a great question from Bryony. Um, why with memories can there be fluctuation? Um, sometimes the memory can be recalled and sometimes not. In dementia specifically, my granddad sometimes doesn't know people or recall them and it takes us by surprise with names and recalling, I guess, yeah, memories from, from the past. Mm -hmm. I guess that's, that's very dementia related, really good question. Hey, did you want to say anything? Yeah, I'm afraid I don't know much about that aspect of dementia. It must be very frustrating for sure, the, the sort of inconsistency of it. It's not a sort of steady decline, at least not to start with. Um, I, I'm not sure. Maybe it's just that they're that you've better rested on some days, less well rested on others, um, feeling more or less healthy. You've got an underlying infection that would definitely worsen your, your memory recall. There's all sorts of things that could be involved, but I don't really know for sure. Yeah, it's it's true, isn't it? That, you know, people with certain dementias have, you know, better and worse days. And there are many, many factors, um, you know, to consider when thinking about why that may be. So, yes, as Hazel said, it could be due to, to sort of underlying issues or even kind of emotional state. You know, if people are feeling upset on a certain day, they may not be able to remember things well and, and I think, you know, sometimes that happens with people who, who, who don't have any, any issues. You know, I certainly forgotten where I parked the car some one time, and that's just because I'm totally stressed leaving work and you know, the wrong floor in the multi-story car park. So, you know, it happens. And um, it's a good point. It happens to the best of us. Yeah. <laughs> if you're having a really bad day, then your memory goes out the window. Yeah, exactly. That's right. So I think, you know, it's a, a similar state, um, but, but obviously worsened when people have these types of dementias and there must be so many connections lost and others retained so I guess it's it's going to be very unique to them isn't it yeah exactly exactly yeah oh another update from Russell saying explain I don't remember in pictures is what I mean oh that's interesting so actually probably really struggle to yeah memorize origami because I think that is all entirely in pictures that I think of which is mind-boggling bizarre um so we've still got some more excellent questions as well, but I really want to introduce these other images as well, because think of the brain as neurons, brain cells, but there are loads of other types of cells. And what do they do? What these amazing names as well, oligodendrocytes. Wow. Um, I don't know whether you can explain about any of these and you can maybe add these to your doodle of the neurons or um, these other incredible colours, again, all artificial, but ways of picking them out. Um, Emma? Yeah, so your oligodendrocytes are really interesting cells. They're really small and um, really highly branched. So you can see in the picture on the top left, the green cells with all those little kind of projections um, are oligodendrocytes. And they play a really important role in releasing a protein called myelin, which coats the, the neuron um, sort of projections and particularly the axon, which is really important for passing information from one neuron to the next. And this kind of this substance myelin helps to kind of insulate the, the neuron almost in, in the same way that you insulate kind of electrical cables to help the information go faster through them um, or the electricity go faster through them I should say when when the neuron axons are insulated the information can pass really quickly and that helps you kind of do things um, you know or recall things quite rapidly in the brain so they're really they're really interesting cells and um, they're particularly important in um, patients with multiple sclerosis so this um, kind of um, effect of generating myelin is often lost and that's why people get the symptoms of multiple sclerosis um, that we see. 
Is, is that related as well to the omega-6 that we've all heard of fish oils being good for us? Is yeah, I think that there is a connection. It's not quite my area of expertise, but it's certainly important to kind of keep um, maintaining that good, healthy diet to keep all of the cells in your brain really, really healthy and functioning well. Yeah, because yeah, as, as Lizzie alluded to earlier, your cells are covered in fats and particularly these insulating, insulating sheaths over the neuron axons as a fatty sheath. And omega-6 is one of these um, important unsaturated fats. So um, fats are really important for your brain and having a good fat composition in your diet certainly helps keep your brain healthy. Excellent. Um, and all these other, other cells, astrocytes, and of course, microglia. I mean, these are not words you ever expected to hear on Saturday morning. Well, what, again, what do they do? You're talking about them as gardeners, the microglia. Yeah, so actually both me and Emma, we both work on microglia. Um, in fact, I used to work with Emma in Oxford and then I moved to Cardiff. Um, it's my field of expertise. I think they're really interesting because, well, they're the small smallest glial cells. So glia are the cells that are not neurons in the brain, basically. And they're all the ones that do supporting functions. And um, right. they, they sort of, they're quite mobile. They sort of patrol little spaces in the brain where they're checking that the neurons are healthy, checking um, for any waste debris, which they then kind of hoover up and eat. Um, quite helpfully, that's how they dispose of it. They actually eat it. Um, and they're also, they're actually your kind of immune systems outpost in the brain, their immune cells. They're looking for invaders or infection as well. Um, so if you had an injury, um, or if you had um, somehow had a bacteria or virus get into the brain, then your microglia would be the first to know and they'd raise the alarm and set off an inflammatory response to that. They're also really important in Alzheimer's disease, which is um, my disease of interest. Um, and they also interact with the astrocytes, which is the one we haven't really discussed yet, um, which also um, get involved in this immune inflammatory response if there's a problem in the brain. Um, and in many respects, they have overlapping functions in supporting the neuronal cells, keeping them healthy, um, making sure that they're not exposed to high levels of toxins. Um, the astrocytes also produce nutrients that the neurons need. Um, they've got so many different roles that I couldn't even begin to describe them. Wow. Why isn't our body just so astonishing? I mean, we're not aware of any of this and yet it all seems to be happening so... I think the funny thing is that they're called glia, which means glue, because the earliest neuroscientists that discovered them thought they were just gluing the brain together. And they're, they're definitely not just glue. They're doing a lot. Oh, so I realise I'm a bit conscious of time. It's coming up to 10 to 12. I'm keen for us to do some origami as well, as well as answering more questions. Maybe just one more question here. Then maybe if we get going on a little bit of origami and we can also try to include questions too. Um, glad we've got 90 minutes. Right, from Ethan. Um, hi, how did you get into research field from GCSEs onwards? This is a great question. Uh, what would be included in the job as interest? in as interested in the sciences and research for the future so I guess some top tips to a young maybe a young budding scientist there yeah I would like to start <laughs> yeah I can do of course yeah and um, so after my GCSEs I took um, A levels so I did a um, well, my A-levels were in biology, chemistry and psychiatry. So I've always been really interested in the brain, um, actually. And, uh, and so went down that kind of route. And then I have a degree in molecular and cellular biology. So that degree is really general. It's, it was definitely not kind of tailored towards neuroscience in any way. But I would recommend that if you're interested in science and you, know, you want to pursue a career, it's really good to kind of keep your options and your kind of, you know, ideas fairly broad to begin with because you know science is such a huge field and you might find that you have a really inspiring lecturer at university or, or you know something and it really sort of takes you down a route that you never really expected so for me having that kind of broad background really helped me learn a lot about um you know about molecular and cellular biology very generally um, but my my interest always kind of remained in neuroscience um, so I went on and did a PhD at um, University College London at the Institute of Neurology 
Um, and uh, I was work that's when I started working on Alzheimer's disease and in particular in the role of microglia in Alzheimer's disease and how they affect the, the progress of um, the pathology. Um, so yeah, that's my kind of qualifications. Um, and uh, yeah, sort of after that, I had to do a postdoctoral position and um, then I've worked in industry for quite a long time before coming back to um, the Drug Discovery Institute. So oh. I would definitely recommend that if you're really interested in, in the sciences that you should, you know, keep, keep your options open, you know, be quite broad and, and take, take, take lots of opportunities to experience time working with other researchers you know, find some good mentors and, um, you know, if you have the opportunity to go and spend a little bit of time, maybe a work placement in a lab, it's a really good, um, good way to see what it's like, you know, to understand exactly how it is to, to have a day in the life of a scientist. I think that's crucial, sort of trying to get that experience is very important. Yeah, any experience, I guess, obviously, at the, at the school stage, obviously working hard and doing well at science, mm -hmm. I guess, also maths. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, yeah, depending on the science. So um, I took biochemistry for my degree and I needed to have biology and chemistry, but I didn't have to have maths, but it was a huge advantage. And they recommended that you try to take at least AS level maths at the time. Yeah. So I, I did do, I didn't do do level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have to say I didn't find math particularly easy and just did GCSE. Yeah. Math, but it, it got me by, but um, yeah. I, don't know, I would just... say in biology, you don't use high level maths. You need to be able to calculate things like concentrations of stuff, um, yeah. but you don't use maths to a very high degree. Whereas if you are fairly mathematically competent, then you might find yourself going more towards chemistry or physics. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm a biologist. <laughs> um, so we're going to keep moving because we should we should get onto the uh, origami side of this as well. Um, I'm hoping that we can do uh, maybe a couple of things too. So you may wonder what on earth the relevance is of origami, and actually, it's very relevant indeed. So our body is made of the big things, the organs. They're then made. Um, up in terms of cells so our body's real building block of cells but actually cells are made of more little things themselves and our DNA encodes things called proteins and it's the way that they fold up that gives them the structure and job is what it's what they do is all determined by how they fold up and of course folding is origami um, and so actually it's about changes in folds that happen that may be responsible for changes of dementia and that there are some little tiny bits of proteins that can start sticking together and forming long chains that could disrupt, maybe kill off some of those delicate connections between cells. So I was I was just sort of imagining as a piece of origami of you know, the fortune tellers, I'm sure you all recognize or you all remember and how they could make lovely long stacks, but actually they're quite hard to then break down um, I don't know if you've got anything else to say about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I quite like this analogy of the fortune tellers stacking together because um, in my field of research, Alzheimer's disease, we're um, particularly focused on a, a protein um, called amyloid that sticks together in that way to form really long strands that are very hard to break down. And because it's quite hard to break down and dispose of, it tends to accumulate in the brain. Uh, so normally it would get removed uh, if you had just little blocks of it. It could be removed by the microglia by eating it. But once it forms very long strands, uh, the best that they can do is sort of corral it together into lumps that become amyloid plaques. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically what that represents is a, a very annoying, difficult protein that causes damage to the brain. Yeah, which your either your gardener or your dustbin person can can remove. Um... So I thought we could do now a couple of pieces of origami, very loosely based on the brain. The first one actually will be what's called a Twisted Rose by Emiko Suzuki. Let me see if I can find you an example. So it's a lovely little rose, again, okay, maybe quite appropriate coming up to Valentine's Day of a rose, but we'll find it will be folding and it starts off smooth, which is a little bit like our developing brain. It starts off quite small and smooth and it then will become a lovely complex structure with many folds. So we're going to have a go at doing that. We'll see how we do for questions. I am keen to 
to do that as well but I'm actually going to stop the share so that you can see what I'm doing I could maybe spotlight me and you've got the choice of whether you go on to gallery view or speaker view and I'm gonna show how to fold a rose so we'll do a little bit of folding first and then we'll see if we can also add in some questions too so grab yourself a piece of paper everyone um I think Hazel's gonna give this a go on you <laughs> yes. great okay so we're going to take a piece of paper um we're going to make a square from one side so I'm going to take my piece of paper and I'm going to fold it in half now my three rules for origami is first one is to be very exact which is a bit like being a scientist actually you do have to try to be careful but um there's something very pleasing about getting things lined up and all nice and neat so I'm just lining up the corners nicely my second rule is to give a good strong fold and it's the fold that will let out a little bit of tension um, and it makes everything work well too otherwise it would unravel but it is quite relaxing my third rule not to forget it's meant to be fun so okay that's important I think that's the best way that we learn things as well so you know what if everything ends up going in a completely different way don't worry you're inventing something new I think it's about that positive kind attitude I've used it very much for well-being origami in this way so all I've done is fold a piece of paper in half I'm next going to do a tiny little nick and I am going to put my hand nice and close to that edge and just tear it off. So all we're doing at the moment is making half a piece of paper, but just to show you that you don't need scissors even. And we're going to make a square. This is a real standard size for doing origami. It's just comfortable in your hand. So we're going to take a corner and we're going to bring it down and line it up along the bottom. I think when we get going on a step where we can be a little bit more repetitive and I can ask a few more questions again too. But there's probably only so much our brains can take in at once, isn't there really? Um, I know I'm the same anyway. So I've lined up the bottom and next I am going to remove this rectangle. So if you take your piece of paper, turn it over, lift this up and squash it back so it lines up. We're just basically making a square. That's all we're doing at the moment. Good strong fold. And then you should be able to again do a little little nick and tear that off. So I think in many ways, well, I think origami is good because it must be giving you a lot, of space on, a lot of stimulation on the spatial side. You might be trying to remember things. You're using your hands. You're certainly having to focus. It's full of meaning. It's all about connection with others as well because you're learning from others. These things have all got to be good, haven't they? Um, I'd love there to be some study on it, but I don't. In some ways, though, I don't think the art should ever be looked at as a medicine. It's part of being human, and we should. We should recognise that without feeling everything has to be about data and measurement. We love it. It's important. It's what, what makes us human. We shouldn't have to justify it too much. So makes us happy. <laughs> That's important. So we've, we've made a diagonal line, hopefully, because if you've been making your square, you've made a line. If you have origami paper, then folding it in half um, so it's on the white side if you did have origami paper. Next, we're going to do the other diagonal line. Here goes. I'm just keeping us just gently on this task for now. So done both diagonals like so. Great. Now take your piece of paper and turn it over. It's like a little tent. Um, you can already see it's got a shape to it. We're going to do a horizontal and a vertical line. I'm going to take this I'm going to just fold it in half to make a rectangle. If you're tall need me to explain, slow down, you're stuck, just say. Folding in half. And then opening it up. I can feel the concentration, it's great. Um, and again, folding it in half. So we did the diagonals on one side, turned it over and did the horizontal and vertical lines. So I actually learned this rose from an amazing origami. She's a primary school teacher in Turkey. How cool is that? These times have like opened up more possibilities. So at the moment it curves up, I actually want it to be a triangle shape. So if you pop your finger underneath the middle and push and it will pop. 
and it will go, that's right, into triangle shape. Great. Now just push the sides in and it will squash down to be a triangle. And as you look down, it would look like that. There we go. Great. Happy? Looks like you're all getting there. Great. So we're going to take a loose, loose end and we're going to bring it up to the top. So we're going to take the corner and bring it up. I hope you're just enjoying the concentration that's going on with this. And being with materials too, I do wonder how much we're, we're online, obviously we're online now, which is a great thing, but doing something active for yourself as well is just really satisfying. Again, that bottom corner, bringing up to the top. Like so. There we go. So you've got these two which are up. Now I just want you to see that's like a little pocket. So if you put your finger into the pocket and squash it down, I'm sort of bringing it downwards, so that lines up and you find a little square is produced. So it's that little pocket, popping your finger in, squashing it down, lining that up, and you'll find it makes a little square, like so. I've also been learning how to fold into a camera because I'm not actually seeing what I'm doing directly, which is amazing. <laughs> it's, again, my head hurts. And there's, there's something we really resist learning new things. I think that's why we have to be very playful and kind to ourselves in learning because it does make our head hurt to learn new things, but I'm sure it's good for us. Again, popping your finger into the pocket, squashing it down. And then there's a real joy as things get easier as well. And then after a while, maybe experiment, do something new. That's it. Great. So if we turn to the back, are you all with me? I'm start asking questions soon. <laughs> there we go. And this bottom corner again, lifting it up. Same thing again. So I guess, Emma, if you're free, have you got any, any thoughts about the question from Jess? What is meant by the blood brain barrier? Yeah. That's such an interesting question. And it's actually, as Jess says, really important because we have heard a lot about it during these COVID times, haven't we? So um, your brain is separated from the rest of your body by the blood brain barrier. And it's really important because it kind of keeps your brain a little bit protected from what's going on inside the rest of your body. Um, now that actually um, presents quite a lot of challenges when we look at trying to make new therapies for the treatment of um, disorders in the brain like Alzheimer's disease because it's actually really hard to get drugs into the brain over this barrier because it's so effective at keeping things out. Um, it's basically a kind of a set of specialised cells that kind of co cover the brain and they just kind of stop kind of things from getting across and particularly drugs so when we make therapies for Alzheimer's disease and when we try and find new drugs we really have to make sure that we've got some really great chemists who can make special kind of modulations and manipulations to the compounds that we're looking at to try and help them bypass that blood brain barrier and um, in disease like Alzheimer's disease your blood brain barrier actually breaks down a little bit so you get some kind of passage of um, of protein and, and sort of factors like inflammatory factors from your body going into the brain and that can have a really detrimental effect so the blood brain barrier is super important um, yeah so you know when we when we think about um, therapies and treatments we really do need to make sure that they're either specifically targeting the brain and able to get through that blood brain barrier or that they don't and because sometimes we don't want to affect the brain at all um, important not to have have an effect on um, on the brain so we need to make sure that they're maybe not able to pass through the blood brain barrier so that they can treat problems that are going on um inside the body and outside of the brain and um, so yeah for your for psychiatric medication it's it's critical that that can enter the brain um specifically interesting so it's it's really taking care of the most important organ mm. not affected by anything absolutely yeah yeah oh our incredible body so hopefully, have you got something which looks, to me, it looks like a little tent. Does it look like a little tent? I always think of Bake Off at this point, but that's probably, again, an association that we had, a positive association in my case. So I want you to think we're going to open up our little tent. So the inside of the tent, that corner, we're going to lift up and bring it out, at, up like that. So can we see it was that inside corner lifting up and out? 
and doing the same on the other corner too. Put it up and out. I love how origami brings you on this whole journey and you have no idea how it can suddenly produce out of all of this a 3D something. There is a real sense of wonder. I love how accessible it is. Anyone can get a hold of paper, even if it's the junk mail that comes through your door. You can make it something cool. And it's also, I think, comes from very much a present culture. The idea of gifts, I think, is a beautiful one. You make something which is a gift to yourself and then you start making more and giving them to others. And it will always make a smile. I mean, I haven't often been given origami. I don't know whether you have, but I'm sure it will make an impact if you were. We should all be making more origami and giving it to each other. Um, so hopefully it's looking like this. Your next step is, can you see there's a little bit sticking down? Lift that up and push it up and it fits in that gap there. So we've done one side there. And we're going to do the same thing on the back. Happy, everybody. So we're going to turn it to the back and again we've got the same thing that inside little bit of your tent opening it up and bringing it back and again the same thing at the bottom of the tent bringing it up opening and maybe it's a could be like a little theater or a circus it, it this is very much art we we have this such a symbolism don't we that we're constantly looking for meaning. Our brains are brilliant at finding meaning and trying to give stories and trying to give it some kind of sense. And in a way, nothing does, but that's what our brain can give. And I guess that's what art is really. Um, again, taking the bottom and lifting up into that gap. There we go. So hopefully you've got a structure like that. I want you now to think of this as a little book. So we can turn the page and it looks smooth. And if you turn to the back and do the same thing at the back there, turning the page um, again to the smooth side, so it's smooth front and back. We're sort of doing the same thing again, although it's a bit strange because we're now taking the bottom corner and lifting it up. So it's the outside corner, lifting it up, squashing it down. So taking the bottom outside corner, lifting it up. And it now looks quite similar to before. You again got a little bit sticking out there. So you can lift that up and fit it in the gap. That's it. And if we turn it to the back, and again, the outside bottom corner. And again, this is all folds, which we do very much think of as brains as folded and wrinkly. Um, as I guess it's it's those, it's those cells that are really processing that are on the surface of our brain and it's a way of packing them into our small little skulls there we go lifting that up and i guess i guess if you look back in terms of evolution our, our brains must have got more wrinkly must they? yeah lifting that up and squeezing it down and you can see with different animals at different areas of the brain are used more so i guess our personality all that thinking of complex things to do with consequences and interaction with others and rights and wrong <laughs> oh yeah are things which which develop hopefully um again that bottom bottom corner and i guess all these areas are also affected for people with dementia too that they're not able to really control those areas which which we hopefully normally do there we go so it's looking hopefully like a almost a bit of a boat would you say great lovely so our next step is we're going to take the very bottom of this and i'm gonna bring it up so i'm gonna stretch it out it feels a little bit tricky at this point stretching it out and squashing squashing it down to make like a little triangle and a little square will form the first time you do this it does feel a little bit oh, like you're having to really reach in and it's all not that easy but it is definitely possible and it will squash down to make a square i'll try to show you again so again i took just one side doesn't matter which side lifting it up and stretching it out and then trying to squash down those those triangles to make them flat and you will end up with a flat little square like so great has that worked for most people it's a little bit of a tricky step there great excellent right so this square i want to be kind of flat 
And I want you to then almost put that flat on your hand and take the top sail of your boat almost and get it to stand up. So it's like this. So it's a flat little structure with a mast sort of sitting up there. Again, I'm trying to find similarities with other things because we all want to make sense of things, don't we? So it's like that. Right, the next step is quite incredible. Again, like our brain. So is this right that sort of when a baby's developing, it's a small, smooth structure and it does become more, more folded as it develops? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so pop this square on your hand and now look down at the top of your mast. And can you see those two little pockets? I want you to put your fingers into the pockets like that and almost fitting a finger between each little side. I'm sort of putting my fingers in each of these sides. I know it's a little harder to see, but it's a great thing having a camera like this. So I'm putting my fingers between each pocket, putting that square on my hand and it will be a bit like magic. <laughs> I'm gonna twirl it round one direction and it will start to lift up. So don't try to keep that square flat. It will lift up and it will twist and turn and become, I promise, a rose. I'm sorry, you can't really see what's happening, but hopefully a little rose will emerge. So keeping your fingers between those little slots and twisting it round. It will be quite unique, actually. <laughs> Like your brain, yay! See what happens. It's trying to keep those separated, I guess, those little pockets, that's it. So don't try to keep that square has become now rounded up. So don't try to keep that flat or it can't curl up and go round. So forget the square bit, it needs to curl up, swirl around together. It is an incredible piece of engineering. Um, you might also want to just curl back the petals. Some of these you could just curl back a little bit. Um, I hope it works. Yay, that's right. So those little pointy bits, you could just slightly curl back a little bit. Lovely, lovely, lovely. And for me, this came from, as I said, an origamist in Turkey. Um, <laughs> so, and for you, it's maybe come from me. <laughs> so it's a gift. Oh, it's so lovely to see. I hope that's worked for most of you. Yeah. Should we take a little screenshot of our roses if you're happy? Lovely to see, like our complex folded brains, right? One, two, three. Aren't our brains incredible? And our hands too. And I think that's probably what gives us a lot of stimulation for our brains. Oh, thanks everyone. It's lovely to see. Hey, and it's, maybe it's bringing on spring as well. I didn't work. Oh, sorry, Russell. Um, I could also towards the end send a little link, or of course this is, this is recorded so you can go back to it as well. It's all about being persistent and kind to yourself. Don't think it hasn't worked. You're just learning. And that's always a real process. So you might be inventing something new as well. We'll make something else in just a moment, which is quite thankfully quite a short one. I'm just seeing whether there are other questions we can ask as well. Oh, from Angie. Is it true that smell evoke, particularly evokes memories? Mother's favourite scent, preparing jams and chutneys, wood smoke, etc. Oh, how lovely. Of this description because the smells and memory centers are close in the brain or are the locations unrelated any thoughts hazel or emma that's a good question i don't think that they're particularly close to each other but the connections between them are quite strong so you can you know in the brain you can have areas that are quite separate but um you know that the neurons talk to each other really well and and connect into each other and that helps to strengthen that um that sort of connection between these smells and, and other perhaps emotional feelings around memories and the memory themselves i was going to say the same i think um the connections are the most important things and there's pretty good connections between the two places um, the connections get stronger the more that you really focus on smells uh, and memories the more you use something the more you gain oh that's nice to think yeah it must be very different being a dog mustn't it <laughs> i think we missed the question that was just a bit before that from yes. oliver king that neurons can be can neurons be artificially replicated is that the is that the one you spotted hazel yeah yeah that's an interesting one because um in the sense of actually just like making it out of synthetic materials we can't do that 
Um, but I work in a job where we create neurons from other cells. Um, and so you can make neurons from, um, in theory, any cell of the body with modern technology, we can turn them into um, what we call stem cells and stem cells are cells that have the ability to turn into any cell type that you want. And there are ways of essentially growing neurons in a dish from these cells, um, which is a very exciting and up and coming field of research. I know Emma's group does a little bit of this as well. Um, turning, uh, creating cell types from stem cells. It's also possible now to create little mini brains, we call them organoids in a dish also, which kind of helps to recapitulate maybe certain, certain bits of the brain. And those have quite good kind of connectivity. They create different sort of areas of the brain. And it's a really cool tool for us to be able to understand what's happening a little bit more and, and also really important for drug discovery. Okay, thanks. Um, I reckon we could do one more quick fold and it's related to the brain, maybe in a su slightly surprising way. Can I show you this? It was designed by someone called David Petty and it's a beating heart. Can you hear it? It actually makes a sound. And the reason why the heart's important, of course, things like emotions you might associate with the heart, but actually the way to keep your brain is to think about how you keep your heart healthy, which is obviously exercise, good diet, um, all of those things that we know are good for our heart are actually good for our brain because it's also about that blood supply, actually. So you'll be relieved to know this is actually quite simple and it even makes it you heard a beating heart noise as well um, so I hope you're going to enjoy this again this will be quite good for Valentine's Day I will also be doing an origami fold I know this is also part of my origami fold every month so we'll be thinking about love more generally for for, for ourselves for family for friends uh, next month as well but this is a really good one so to do this grab yourself either A4 or the other A5 piece that you've got we're not using a square for this one, so it's different. So it's actually the ratio of three by one. So if you are using, for example, A4 paper, this is 21 centimeters, so I need to measure seven centimeters. So I happen to have a ruler, but if you think about it, it's doing it roughly as a proportion, it will be fine. So I am going to mark this to show you. So it's interesting as a strip, um, and it's rather touching because um, David Petty sadly is not with us anymore. As with many origamists, they've made discoveries and then passed it on. I just think it's such a beautiful thing. We're making a heart from someone else. It keeps beating. And that, that is what culture ultimately is. And with science, it's people who made their discoveries, passed it on. Maybe passing things on in a good way. <laughs> So a strip these sort of dimensions. So this would go into this three times. Mm. So I guess, for example, Jess, if you had origami paper, you could take the square and kind of squiggle it back to make a three. Let me see if I can show that. <laughs> that looks good. Yeah. Maybe a bit long, actually, is it? Yeah. <laughs> so it'll otherwise affect how the heart looks. Um, it's mm. great. Oh, I don't know if I... What was the ratio again? Uh, so, three to one. One. so this was actually three the one. One. Okay. of a piece of paper. As it was landscape, so, it was the height of it. So this is so nine centimeters by three by seven. Sorry. Uh, nine centimeters by three. Yes, that yes. would be correct. <laughs> I failed my score level three times, so I have to double check. That's great. Excellent. Hope you're going to like this one. So I wait for everybody to get their little strips ready. Happy. Hey, so are you looking for some paper? <laughs> looking a bit puzzled. Mm. <laughs> it's a good one. Yeah. Just so it looks roughly. What do you reckon? Yeah, that looks good. That looks the right proportion. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Happy everyone? 
Well, that's great. So what we're going to do is we're going to first of all fold it in half. So we're going to take one end and match it up. And as I said, I'm going to load this on my YouTube channel. So if you haven't had a chance to go and get the right piece of paper this time, you can just go to the end and look at that. So I'm just simply folding it in half like so. Great. Oh, it starts simple. That's what I love about it. Now we're going to take the bottom edge and we're going to lift it up along that vertical line. So we're going to take that bottom edge and lift it up along that vertical line. Again, just take your time, matching it all up. This is definitely harder to do into camera. <laughs> there we go. And the same with the other the bottom edge, lifting up along that middle line. I'm going to check what I'm doing. It, it, this is a good one to try to be exact because it actually wants to work like the heart itself. Again, lifting it up along that midway line. And as I said, consider this all learning. So if it's not feeling like it's going right this time, you will get there. It's all about persistence and being kind to yourself and doing that. Um, learning something new is always a bit hard, isn't it? But it's, it's again, it's encouraging that plasticity in our brain, which is a good thing. Right. Happy? You've all got that. It looks like it could be a paper aeroplane. It could be a paper aeroplane. Great. We're going to now turn it to the back and you can see it's got that line there. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this diagonal side and we're going to bring it to the vertical line. Now, just take the sort of bottom of that line. Don't fold the back piece of paper. So I take this and I swivel it around. Can you see I've not touched this flat piece of paper? Otherwise, it, it won't look as good a heart. So we're taking this edge, twizzling it round to match up with this midway line and squashing it down. So it was that one matching it up there. That's great. Yeah, maybe you can have a go at these afterwards, Emma. I completely get that. It's very hard multitasking, isn't it? And sometimes these things can work. Yeah. I found actually I've been trying to work with people who try to do other things at the same time. Don't even bother to do the origami because it will just frustrate you. You need to give it full attention, full focus, which is why it's relaxing. You can try it later, can't you? Absolutely, so gonna, I will do. <laughs> we're going to try this bottom diagonal line. And again, twisting it around, not folding the paper and squashing it down like that. So I guess it's in looking after our hearts, we're thinking about how to keep our blood supply working well, which is also what's needed for our brain to work well. And uh, the things like um, MRI, which I'm sure heard of, or functional magnetic resonance imaging, where you can look at which bits of your brain are busy and it's about looking at that blood flow, which areas are, are taking up, needing more oxygen. Um, and that's how you can see what your brain's doing. It takes up, it's about a fifth of, our, fifth of our food goes to our brain. So you're gonna be hungry after this. <laughs> Great, so hopefully you've got something you're just looking at bit like a heart it looks a little bit pointy great so take the points and just fold back those points a little bit just to soften it just to soften that heart a bit and the same with the outside points we're almost there there we go and the outside points too there we go so we've made heart, but it doesn't seem to beat. So we, we need to get going on the inner workings of this heart. Great, great. So if you turn it to the back and you can see this little structure here, what I want you to do is take that top diagonal side and fold it along that vertical line, like so. So it's that top diagonal side, folding it along the vertical line getting it nicely exactly through that point. Be quite critical if you can to get it right. I was thinking this is, this is like the scientist to me, wanting to get things right. Whereas the artist, I'll just take no notice, just see whatever happens. Where I think origami is very much the sort of science and art. The, it's about making something that will work. There's something very pleasing about that as well. 
great. So it's looking like that. So we're almost there. So we're going to be making a little handle, which then you'll squeeze, and that's what make the heartbeat. So we're going to open up those. I always like to think, open a present. It's a nice feeling. <laughs> Opening those flaps, taking the middle and pulling it down. Tuck it. This is the mind boggling bit. So we've opened up those flaps, taking the middle, pulling that down, and we're rolling in the side. So the top will go quite easily. The bottom, you're going to have to play around a little bit, but you're wanting to get that as a point. I'm going to have to see what I'm doing. I'm definitely pushing myself a bit too much there. So you'll have to sort of almost slightly reform the edges. But what you're aiming for is a little point. And this is a tricky little step for sure. But what you're trying to do is make a little handle. And as long as you're gentle and you can, the paper will change its position. You can refold to your happy, but what trying to make is a little handle, is a little point like that. Hopefully, if you've got something that's a little bit like a handle, you can hold it between your two fingers like that and having your thumb underneath and squeeze. And hopefully it will start to beat. <laughs> so vital signs of life. <laughs> So our brain stems are definitely working as well. Yay! How's it going? Maybe I can take a screenshot of this one as well. So if I if I do a one, two, three, oh, for all those hearts, thank you. Great to see these hearts. Right, one, two, three. Oh, one minute for Jess. Oh, you've made a very delicate, beautiful little heart from the origami paper, isn't it? Right, one, two, three. Lovely. One more shot. Great. How can you make it be? Ah, so that little handle at the back. Squeeze yeah. it. So you've got your thumb underneath and your fingers. Oh. Under <laughs> oh, you can do it. Butterfly doing this. Yes, it is like a butterfly. Yeah. Oh, really lovely. Thank you, Lucy. <laughs> very very welcome so glad it worked so hopefully we've uh, yeah we've done some lovely things really quickly um it would be fantastic to get your feedback we'd really appreciate it um so i've done another little poll so you just three questions also if you wanted to write in the chat box any improvements, suggestions, anything you want to say at all. So chat box, you can put that in. I'll remember to copy and paste it before, but the poll's just really quick. Um, I will see if I can bring that up. This is me oh. learning things. Here we go. So I'm launching the poll. Hopefully there you go to three questions. First one, did you enjoy this event? Do be honest. It's not useful unless you're honest. Um, I enjoyed using craft, craft or creativity question or was inspired by research be honest because that's that's what we need when will the next one be ah the next one so next one uh will be in february and it'll be back to just straight origami and it'll be on the subject of um of love more generally let me have a look so i'm tending to do it sort of the second second saturday of the month now and actually that'll be good timing 12th i reckon saturday the 12th of february from 11 till 12 normally so this has been an extra long one hope that sounds good thank you you're welcome uh i can send a message after this to everybody signed up for event right just to let you know I, I, i'm not doing it as a as a you know as you're not subscribing to anything i'm just doing that as a one-off so that you can know when the next thing is if that sounds okay Hope that sounds a plan. Great. And you've all been answering that. Presumably it's all saved there. Great. Excellent. Yeah, and feel free to put in anything you want to say in the chat box. It's all welcome. It's to learn and to improve. Um, that's brilliant. I will we'll end the poll, share the results.
And also, I don't know, Katie, whether you wanted to say anything about other things that Alzheimer's Research UK offer to be able to hear about the, the research they're making possible. Is that real hope for improving things? Um, yeah, I'm happy. To. So we, um, if you're interested in hearing more about research that we're supporting, we run a series called Lab Notes. Um, I'll pop a link um, in here and I'm sure if Lizzie can share it as well. So it's talks and questions and answers with uh, researchers. Um, and the next one of those is in February. And I can't remember the exact date, so I don't want to give you the wrong one. Um, and we're doing them this year every two months. So there'll be six of them happening in 2022. And we've also got lots of um, ones recorded from last year as well. So if you're interested in finding out more, um, I'll pop a link in, in the chat, but there's lots of lots of ways to find out online about um, some of the work that we're doing. Excellent. Oh, and thank you. Thank you. So, and thank you for supporting this project. It's been fantastic. So this is the final event from that. Um, but as you know, I'll continue with this, a small grant from the lottery to be able to, to offer uh, monthly folds, which I think will be until June. So once a month there. Um, also from Jags, good question. Um, so I missed the beginning. Is it recorded anywhere? Yes, I'm recording this and I will upload it to my YouTube channel. So if I put that in the chat box as well. Um, but if you just look up my name, Dr. Lizzie Burns, you'll find me. Um, and actually, I work one day a week in a hospital, UCH in London, um, supporting staff and patients on wellbeing. And through that work, um, because we have to keep remote for, for patients at the moment still, since the pandemic, of course, um, then I've actually been recording an origami fold every week. I've no idea how I've done that. It's been a real challenge. Um, and a live fold most Wednesdays at two. So that could help support your well-being give you that mental stimulation help lift your mood and feel free to share with anyone you feel could could enjoy that it's great to do as an adult as well as a child so um yeah i don't know whether there's anything else that you want to say emma hazel thank you so much for your time and collaboration and i hope oh, thank you for inviting us it's been really good fun and it's great to see all of the work that you've done put together in the, the single place <laughs> Yeah. Thanks to everyone for the great questions. It's been uh, it's been really nice to to sort of see you all virtually and, and speak to you. Yeah, it's been great fun. Thank you for joining us, everybody. I'm going to make sure I copy and paste all those comments before uh, before before we pack up. Uh, if there's anything else that anybody wants to say, as I said, put it in the chat box or feel free to say. We're just a fairly small group, so. Um, yeah, and it will be online there. So I will also send that link when it's up there to everybody afterwards so that you know you can go back to it. Maybe you want to make some more beating hearts or roses. As I said, it's such a great thing to kind of repeat things and you'll find it gets easier. It's, it's lovely to feel that your brain can master something. I thoroughly recommend it. The sense of achievement is great. And I think most of all, because it's a little bit hard, um, that's actually what makes it in many ways enjoyable I think it's positive attitude to, to challenge and to realizing we can always learn new things that's what our brain's incredible about being uh yeah doing new things which creativity is all about thank you I guess that's it I hope wish you all a really good weekend um and hopefully see maybe some of you next month as well it'd be fantastic to to have you join and i'll find out various different hearts things we can fold to so um we've already done a few today haven't we thank you bye-bye bye bye thanks lizzie oh See you on wednesday oh lovely one. oh lovely they're lovely aren't they there and I'm really inspired to try and turn this into a butterfly. Oh, that's a good idea. Brilliant. Yeah, I just I just love they, this way. They've got a life, haven't they? You're right. Yeah, they have. That's yeah. Really Thank you very much for your time today and to all the your brainy colleagues as well. <laughs> they are brainy. <laughs> they are brainy colleagues, most definitely. Um been really interesting my mum had early onset dementia so it's something I'm quite conscious about and it's just really interesting the more people know about the brain which is kind of a mystery yes. to so many of us you know um 
and we you know we read about it but we don't really know what all these words mean or what the functions are and what they actually do so having something in layman's terms is is really interesting so thank you very much to you oh, you're very welcome i'm glad it's been it's been fun to to bring yeah. together my two worlds together oh well look after yourselves take care thank you i will end shop bye bye everyone